When The Guardian launched a climate change campaign last year, it noted that although the issue is perhaps the biggest global story of the moment, it rarely makes the news headlines. So why has the media found it so hard to sustain its attention on the issue and to direct readers and viewers to action to help address the problem? And is it right for news organizations to run single-issue crusades rather than striving to be balanced and objective? Welcome to The Big Question, the monthly video series from Capital Ideas at Chicago Booth. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Alan Rusbridger is the principal of Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, and was editor-in-chief of The Guardian from 1995 to 2015. Under his leadership, The Guardian became the first British newspaper to win a Pulitzer Prize for its stories on the National Security Agency's surveillance activities based on leaks from Edward Snowden. His last big campaign at The Guardian urged institutions to remove oil, coal and gas companies from their portfolios and the international community to leave many proven fossil fuel reserves in the ground and promote solar power. And Guy Rolnick is a clinical associate professor of strategic management at Chicago Booth. He founded and served as editor-in-chief of The Marker, the Israeli financial news company, which ran a five-year campaign against the concentration of economic power in Israel that resulted in legislation in 2013 to break up the country's conglomerates. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. Alan Rusbridger, let me start with you. When you were running this climate change campaign, you called it the biggest story never told. What does that tell us about the state of the media? Well, this, when I was about to step down as editor, I wondered what regrets I would have. I'd done the job for about 20 years, and I thought probably the big regret was that we hadn't done justice to this enormous story, which, if we believe the scientists, uh, by some margin, is the biggest story in the world. Uh, and yet, if you look at the number of times that it is ever on the front pages of any newspaper, you would never guess that it was the biggest story. So it wasn't that The Guardian had not covered this story adequately. I, I think we had. But there was something about journalism, I felt, that simply wasn't breaking through. And so I sat down with a group of colleagues and we decided that we would do uh, something that is perhaps not very British, not very American in, in terms of journalism, which was to launch an outright, an outright campaign. So you'd captured it in bits and pieces, but you hadn't told the overarching story or was it the campaign part that you hadn't done? Well, I, uh, I had a very interesting meeting in Stockholm the, 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 a couple of months earlier, uh, where both uh, I and a, a, a journalist called Bill McKibben, who's now a, a campaigner, uh, had won a prize. And we, we sat there in Stockholm talking. And, and Bill said, I think the mistake you're making is to regard this as an environmental story. You guys have done brilliantly on the science. The science is now pretty much beyond doubt. Uh, but this story is now economic and it's political, and those are the people who should be covering it. So I think maybe there was a sort of category error that uh, we still had the environmental correspondents who were very good uh, covering the story, but really the people who needed to be convinced and needed to be writing about this were the political correspondents, uh, the economic correspondents, the security correspondents, all the things that are going to be affected by climate change. You were the editor-in-chief. Why hadn't you seen that before? Well, maybe you, maybe you need to go and spend some time hanging out in Stockholm to see things more clearly. I mean, I, I think in my mind, I, I probably had pigeon, pigeonholed it too much. I'd, you know, we had great uh, science and environment correspondence, uh, and I hadn't stopped and thought more clearly how we needed to cover this story. Guy Rolnick, do you think this tells us something about the media and its ability to connect the dots sometimes? Yes, it tells us, first of all, the media, it's not that the media cannot connect the dots. I'm sure that the Guardian people and all the, most of the journalists around the world can connect the dots on the environmental issue and the climate change. The question is, how do journalists perceive their mission? And if we look at the, I don't know, last decades, maybe more than decades, uh, journalists uh, did not really like the idea of campaigning in a way. And if we look at the last time major media outlets went campaigning really massively in order not only to inform the public, but to change reality, it was probably in the United States 100 years ago in the muckraking uh, 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 era. And I think that what happened, I haven't discussed it thoroughly with Alan, but I think what happened here is that uh, he decided that he does not want only to report, but he wants to judge his work 
on change, on impact. Now, when you decide that you are not only doing decent reporting, but you want to see change, you want to move the needle, and if you are serious, what happens is that you try to look at how the world works in a more deeper way, and then you realize that in order to have real impact, you have to change the modus operandi of how you do journalism. And you have to be much more systematic. You have, much, you have to campaign. Uh, you have to uh, do it for a very long period of time. You have to uh, have an entire team of journalists and editors working on it. And you have to, in, in many ways, you have to ditch some of the conventions about how you do journalism. And I think that it's high time that uh, journalists around the world, and especially editor-in-chiefs around the world, understand that in, there are a specific point in time in the history that you have to be engaged in campaigns. Because on the other side, take uh, climate change. So as we know, there are many vested interests uh, that uh, like the status quo and they don't want us to uh, stop uh, 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 destroying the environment. Now on the other side, people are not working the, sa the same. They are very focused, they have planes, they have a lot of resources, and the only way to, if you want to really change the, the reality, you have to start working the same way as your rivals are. And this is where you start uh, campaigning. Right, so to quote a notorious economist, not just to analyze the world in various ways, but the point is to change it somehow. Is that really the role of journalism, Alan Rusbridge, to change the world? Well, I, I mean, I, I think lots of people go into journalism because they do want to change the world. Um, I mean, I, I think you have to be very sparing in it. And I, I edited it for 20 years and, and I didn't do much overt campaigning. I'm de depending on what you mean by campaigning. You know, we, we, we wrote about phone hacking for seven years. We wrote about corruption in British aerospace for uh, for um, you know, 20 years, but those were bits of reporting that we sustained over a long time. You know, some people would call them campaigns, but but if you're going to do something which is more um, overtly campaigning, I think you have to choose your ground carefully. And the reason I thought I was happy about this is because the science was so overwhelmingly on one side. Most people agree. Uh, I, you know, I know there are people out there who, who will never agree, but, 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 but most people agree, so they that, agree that, on the causes, that this is a, a settled question. They agree on the, on the causes, perhaps, but you, you went further and gave some proposals to how to tackle them, which there's not consensus about. Th th that's right. But I mean, just, just to draw this distinction, so on something like genetically modified food, mm -hmm. I think the science is out. You know, it could, it could, could go either way, and the, and the best way we can help our readers is by reporting on both sides. Here, where you've got you know, X percentage of scientists, a very high number, who are saying this is the, the major threat to, uh, to, to um, the human species, then I think you're, you, you can sit, you know, to take, jump off the fence and take one side and, and try and do something that is going to wake people up. But there is a question about objectivity there, isn't there? Because presumably you, you, you gave the proposals which we, we talked about at the beginning. Um, you're not presenting the full picture because, as Guy said, there are people on the other side of those proposals who have their own arguments to make. And presumably, if you're running a campaign, you don't present their arguments, in the, at least not in the same way as your own. So how do you think about objectivity? I've never, I've never really believed in objectivity. Um, I, I know it gets taught in some journalism schools, but um, you know, I just think the moment we start framing a debate, the very moment you write your first sentence, you're, you're, you're promoting some information above others. You know, I can, I can believe in concepts like fairness. I think proportionality is quite a good concept. Um, but I think objectivity it is one of the reasons we get into this mess. So, um, and you see organizations like the BBC really struggle with climate change because they're, they are bound to be impartial. Uh, and, you know, that leads them sometimes, if you have, you know, somebody coming in saying the, the world is in terrible trouble, um, because uh, the, the scientific catastrophe is about to happen. Somebody thinks, well, we must have somebody now sitting in that chair saying it's not the case. And you could believe that was a 50-50 argument instead of a 90%, 10% argument or whatever it is. So I think objectivity can lead you into trouble. But that's an interesting case because, as you say, 97% or so of scientists uh, agree that 
you know, people are, humans are causing climate change, and yet the 3% of scientists have a huge uh, voice in the media because of this issue. Why do you think, you, you took the BBC as one example, but there are many other media organizations. Why have they got hung up on this idea of being balanced on something when they wouldn't be so balanced on other scientific issues? Well, I think like that is, uh, evolution. I, that's I, a, I think that is a, a problem with the way that journalists are trained in some parts of the world, because because uh, objectivity b b achieves a sort of holy holy status, which uh, I don't think it should have. Uh, if you were proportional about and say, well, we should, you know, let, let's say it's, you know, people will argue with whatever I say. Well, let's say it's ninety ten. Um, if if you had nine scientists and 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 one, that seems to me fair. Um, you know, because it is important that dissident views and minority views are, are allowed out. And, and we, we did do that in, in uh, the campaigning that we did. We allowed people to respond. Um, but we did want to create an impact and, and to make people wake up because, because in most, the overwhelming majority of the media, uh, this subject, which is so potentially catastrophic for us all and our children, uh, is simply not being covered. It's a great mystery. Go, go on it. So, I, of course, I do agree with uh, Alan that uh, objectivity is not the way to do uh, journalism. I never believed in uh, uh, objectivity in uh, journalism, but actually objectivity is usually, when you're trying to be objective, is it basically is cementing the status quo. Uh, when you are trying to be objective, you are in many ways ignoring uh, what we know about how the world works. We're ignoring the fact where where is power and where is the dispersed public. We know the, of the collective action problem and then we know that it's close to impossible for the dispersed public to uh, come together and be represented in politics. We know that it's only the concentrated interests, the big corporations, other special interests that can lobby, that can uh, buy science, buy media, buy politicians. So if we want to be objective, basically we agree with this status of the world. We want it, and, and, and we ignore how politics works and how money works. Uh, and I think that uh, the role of uh, media in many, many ways is not only to inform the public, to do investigative reporting, but to try to balance uh, uh, the power uh, to, take, to, to try to overcome this collective action uh, uh, problem. The, the, the dispersed public many, many times cannot be represented in a democracy. And the only way that you can give more uh, representation to dispersed public in climate change or whether in any other uh, big issues now is that, that you have to see the media as the main vehicle to give more power and influence to the dispersed public. And the only way to do it many times is to take a stand. And you have to take a stand not only when you have this 97%, 3%. The important places where you have to take a stand is where you understand that there is huge imbalance of power between the dispersed public and the concentrated uh, uh, interest. And if we look around, climate change is only one manifestation of this problem. We see it in many other places. Take the whole notion of what's happening today in money on politics. I don't know if it's 97% of the people, that, of the scientists that say that money in politics is wrong. But I do know that the status quo is very powerful and uh, it's very close to impossible. And we haven't seen yet a lot of campaigns like The Guardian is doing about climate change, about money in politics. There is reporting about it, but it's a reporting done in the modus operandi of anecdotal news cycle and so on. And the way to go about those things is not only what you report, is that you have to create a new ecosystem that creates different incentives for decision makers. Decision makers, be it politicians and regulators, have to know that the media is out there to change the ecosystem in a way that you don't cater for special interests, but rather you cater for the dispersed public. I mean, you describe media as almost like a counterbalance to those who empower or set right. the ideological tone. Media's role, main role is to, uh, uh, to shame politicians 
and to force politicians into going after special interest groups. I wonder though, if, if you scrap objectivity and, and even fairness, you... you... No, I wouldn't, scrap, I wouldn't scrap fairness. I don't think they'd say come together. Okay, uh, well let's say if you scrap objectivity, are you, would you be concerned though that uh, we lead to a world where everything looks, everything is viewed through a very strong uh, filter? So we, we all become either Fox News or MSNBC, where, where the, the reporting is extremely biased, and, uh, and the idea of fairness is kind of a, a slogan, but nothing more. Alan Rusby. Well, I, do, I mean, that's why, why you have to be careful. But, but I, I got somebody to look at some figures when I was doing this campaign. And it is the, 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 the lack of coverage of this, <laughs> of this subject is the striking thing, not, 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 the, um, not the degree in, in which people are pursuing campaigns like we were doing. I mean, I, I think... Um, I'll, I'll almost certainly get this wrong, but the, the, the number of times that, that climate change was on the front page of the New York Times was, was in single figures in, in the space of a year. Um, the, the, the Sunday morning chat shows in, in, in America, barely, barely discussed. So uh, that, that, that to me is the, the really striking thing. I mean, you, you, can, you can say the Guardian, you know, dialed up the, 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 the notch too, too much if you, if you like, but, but but really, as journalists, we ought to be uh, asking why the reverse is true. Why, why is it that people have down, down, um, the, the dialed down the the, uh, the the button on this to the extent that that it's barely being covered? Do you think and the problem the, you is know, the, you know the various theories? You know, I mean, the, 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 I mean, we, you know, where do you want to start? You know, it could be to do with, with the ownership of the press and and, and with the, the ideological instincts of the people who own the press. It could be that the readers are too bored or too frightened of the subject. It could be that journalism is brilliant at describing things that happen, but, but hopeless at anticipating what things might happen. Um, I mean, I, I think the, the readers, the, the fault is not just with journalists. I, I think uh, another factor today is that, is that journalism is precisely measurable. So we, we know exactly who is reading what. And I suspect a lot of editors think, well, actually, readers are not reading this. Uh, and if they don't want to read it, we're not going to give it to them because we've got to go for clicks. Uh, uh, so th there are many complex underlying reasons that is, that is leading to this. But it is a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe in terms of, uh, of the politicians having freedom to act. Because how can you act if, if, the, if the public to whom you're going to have to do some unpleasant things because there are going to have to be some unpleasant choices taken in the next 10 years, are completely uninformed about what's going on. Okay. You, you, you referred earlier to the fact that people don't read stories about climate change. They, they, don't, they don't get many clicks. Is that a problem? Does an organization like The Guardian uh, have less influence now because there, maybe there's climate change fatigue? Well, it's, it's not just the the Guardian. I, I think it's uh, there is a problem with compassion fatigue, and, and you know, maybe the more you're aware of of the the infinite problems out there in the in the globe to do with the environment and security and immigration and, and hunger and water, all these issues, may, maybe readers at some point just think this is all beyond me, and I can't I can't do anything about it. And, and in a way, you, have you made that worse by packing everything together? Because you put many of those issues, migration and water into this, and, and, and weather, yeah. into this one well, giant story. Well, the, the, that is the nature of the story, that, that if, you, if you say, well, okay, let, let's, let's forget the climate, what, what it is, that you, what, are you, what are you worried about? Are you worried about too many immigrants turning up in your country, or are you worried about security issues, or are you you're worried about food, or, or uh, the economy, whether you're going to have it? All these issues will be made worse by climate change. And there are people who think that Syria is a climate change story. Um, but I, but I think in a broader, there's, there's quite interesting research going on about the psychology of the brain uh, and the, the, the thought that, that climate change is a story that is so frightening that the brain sort of shuts down. And there are psychologists now who are trying to say, well, you know, stop being so negative about it. Let's try and find solutions-based answers uh, because otherwise people are just going to turn off. It, it's, it's, it's too frightening. And, and I think... I think a lot of activists are now thinking that, that we've, we've, we've turned the public off by just being frighten, frightening. Let's try and find another way of talking about the environment. 
Guy. So I would add two things here. The first is that it's the journalist and the editor's responsibility to make those issues more entertaining in order to make sure that there is not that fatigue. And the other thing, of course, is that we are not uh, uh, aiming only at the general public. The general public tends to be, as you said, irrationally uh, ignorant because the costs of obtaining uh, uh, information about climate change uh, for any individual and the, and, the, uh, and the rewards for that makes it basically let other people uh, do it. Uh, media, as we know, uh, influences mostly decision makers and the elites and the politicians. So when you are devising such a campaign, you're not only looking at let's enlighten hundreds of millions of people around the world. You know how politics works and you know how reputation in politics works and you know how regulators work and you know how legislators. And when you're doing such a campaign, many times you target those people. You create incentives on them to do the right things and you create disincentives to cater to special uh, interest groups. Now, when you're looking not on the general population, but rather on, on the elites, on the decision makers, there are many ways that the, that the media can be very effective. Like in the case of the Guardian campaign, they targeted the companies that were investing in, in, uh, in, uh, in fossil fuels. Uh, and of course, one of the, the audience of this uh, reporting was not only the general public, but you knew that the owners and the uh, CEOs and the management of those companies are reading The Guardian and they don't like the fact that you are targeting the, them and you're giving them basically uh, uh, incentives to change the ways. So it's not only the general like, public. Well, actually, what we did was, was slightly different. And, and I think in classical campaigning terms, what we did was, was too complicated. Um, we thought about targeting the, the companies and we thought, you know, is, is that really going to work? And we, we thought about targeting the consumers, you know, but uh, we didn't think that was going to work. Uh, we thought the money is really interesting because it, it seems to me the, the money has not woken up to what's going on, and particularly this argument about, around stranded assets, that, that if we burnt all the coal, gas uh, and oil that we have, then we're going to be way over you know, three to five times over uh, anything that's going to keep us within two degrees. It's, it's very simple. That's maths. two degrees of global warming. Two of degrees of global warming, yeah. uh, which everybody agrees is, you know, that's a very good figure because everyone agrees at two degrees. Um, so you've got this stranded, issue, stranded assets issue that we can't burn the stuff. And so therefore, whatever these companies are valued at, that valuation is almost certainly wrong. So the interesting th thing to me about the campaign that we ran, which we, we went into it in a sort of slightly moral way, is this, is, is this like South Africa? Is this like you know, tobacco? The place it hit home was in the city because there were lots of people who handle investments. You mean the city of London, of course. City, sorry, the city, the, the, the financial community, who sat up and thought, oh, we hadn't been told this story about stranded assets. Uh, and for me, the, 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 the sort of crowning moment of, of the campaign was not that people suddenly started divesting, that the, we, we targeted two particular very large investment funds. It was when the governor of the Bank of England came out, went on television, and used precisely the campaigning language that we've been using, which was, came from Bill McKibben and his, his organization, 350 Degrees. And the governor of the Bank of England said, this is a huge problem. There are three figures you need to bear in mind. One is two degrees, one is the, the amount that's in the ground, uh, and one is the amount that can be safely burned. So he used exactly All the same language. All those figures came from your newspaper. Yeah, and he said, this is a big problem. And that suddenly you had the investment community thinking, well, hold on, we should be paying attention to this. Uh, and because what we own is not worth what we think it's it going to own. It can't be worth what so we think So you're, you're to blame for the commodities crash then? Well... <laughs> I mean, I, I happen to think if you're a long-term investor, of course, there are going to be lots of people who will make quick money. But if you're, if you're thinking long-term about well, what is sustainable, i.e. our pensions, then why would you want to be in these companies which are not going to be allowed to burn them? Just on climate change, how do you... How do you the Guardian's a very global 
globally aware newspaper and sort of thought of as a liberal newspaper. How do you uh, respond to the criticism that this argument, which you called keep it in the ground, it, it was a, a large amount of these natural resources are going to have to stay underground if, if we're going to keep to this 2% limit to global warming. That, that's a very kind of developed world view. And there are lots of poor countries that are counting on those assets. What would you say to countries like Argentina or Venezuela that have these assets and need them, but you're telling them that they can't develop them? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the classic case at the moment is India. Um, and you know, we reported on the big choice that India has to make. It's got tons and tons of coal. It's also got lots of sunlight. Um, and you know, India could make the wrong decision or they can make the right decision. And, and one would be really good for the health and long-term sustainability of uh, the Indian people and, and their economy. Uh, and one would be really bad. Same is true in, in China. Uh, so I don't think these are first world arguments. Um, but it, there is certainly a need for the money to start switching out of these uh, doomed and, and, and polluting and health harming uh, uh, fuels into uh, into solar or wind or sustainable fuels and and that's going to be utterly to the benefit of um, developing countries and if they can take advantage of that revolution they're going to leapfrog over uh, countries that are still in the mindset of of, um, of fossil fuel economies guy with the marker in Israel you were in a very small country and focused on a very uh, specific problem this is a huge global issue that involves all sorts of countries that where you know the Guardian maybe has less influence how do you view your what you achieved in Israel compared to this challenge so in a way in our uh, so it was easier for us because we're in a smaller country and uh, the marker in Haaretz has uh, significant that's the, that's the kind of bigger newspaper the bigger newspaper so have uh, uh, a significant influence on the the public discourse, uh, uh, the public discourse in Israel. The problem, of course, is that our campaign, uh, we wage uh, almost a war on the most powerful uh, uh, business groups in Israel. The, uh, there are only four or five of them controlled uh, almost half of the economy. And they not only have huge influence on politics, but they also control most of the media. So the challenge in that respect was uh, pretty, uh, pretty significant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we of course looked at something very local. We didn't have the pretense of uh, changing the world. We cannot uh, uh, change uh, uh, climate, uh, uh, climate change. But what I learned from this uh, uh, campaign is that if you really want to change, if you really uh, want impact, uh, the modus operandi, the, the way you work, is very different from what we teach in the journalism uh, school. You have to uh, work like your rivals. The rivals uh, don't uh, uh, run for short uh, distances, they are uh, long term and you have to work with a large group of people, you have to build coalitions, uh, and you have to be systematic about it, and you have to pound the message time and again because people are rationally ignorant, and it takes uh, at least 100 times until uh, you start really uh, conveying the message, uh, you have to repeat it time and again. Uh, I think that in the case of uh, money and politics, uh, uh, climate change, there is no other way for, uh, for the media. It has to change the way it works. If it will continue to, wor to, uh, to, to work as it's been working in the last uh, decades, we can safely say that media is part of the, uh, uh, the, the problem, part of the ecosystem and it doesn't want, really want to change. When you really want change, you understand that you have to work in a different way. Okay, Alan Rosbridger, you launched this campaign just before you were stepping down after 20 years editor-in-chief of The Guardian. What, what did you, how did you set up an institution there that would carry on after you? What are the plans for the next 10 or 20 years uh, to carry this on? Maybe long after The Guardian stops printing a physical print edition. I mean, I, I think, we had a terribly interesting time doing it because we um, 
we brought in campaigners to work with us, um, and uh, and they thought completely differently from us. And so you'd have sort of seasoned journalists sitting over there, and then you know young people with their laptops on their knees who who would say, well, you know, we're we're, we're trying to get Bill Gates to um, to take his money out of fossil fuels. Shouldn't we be doing as you know? Shouldn't we be getting uh, hundreds of people to send video messages to Bill Gates? And you could see the journalists here yes, thinking, well, that's not journalism. Uh, and then they would mock up what they meant, and they would think, well, actually, that's, that's rather that's rather exciting. So I think there was we, we created a nucleus of people in the, in the Guardian who knew about campaigning techniques. We we had formed alliances with campaigning organisations. Uh, we saw the impact of what we did, and and how you could very quickly move the needle in a way that years of environmental coverage hadn't. So I think we, we learned different ways of behaving. We learned about the importance of video, to, you know, especially to younger people. Um, I mean, my, my, uh, my successor decided that she wanted to move the uh, emphasis more onto hope so that they would do more on the solutions uh, and, and not simply on the, on the problems. And I think that's, that was a good idea. I mean, if you, if you saw the, you know, the amount of dreary, negative um, pieces in the, the British press about any forms of uh, non-fossil fuel energy, I mean, it's almost as a sort of uh, a determination to crush them out. But, but actually, you can write hopeful pieces and say these technologies are working, especially in, in, in developing countries. There's lots of money to be made out of them. Um, it's not going to harm people's health. And so why wouldn't you want to put your money in, in there, given that your money is going to be very vulnerable over here? I mean, there's so much common sense here, but it need, did need somebody to, to sit down and, and, and start writing. Common you know. sense, good old-fashioned campaigning journalism. Thank you. On that note, uh, our time is up. My thanks to our panel, Alan Rusbridger and Guy Rolnick. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at chicagobooth.edu capideas and join us again next time for another big question. Goodbye. <laughs>